Speedway Report is produced and broadcast by the Zeus Radio Network for Racers Reunion Radio. Well, the Snowball Derby weekend is finally completed down in Pensacola, Florida, and it set up red flags on two situations. One is something I have talked about for years. The other is something we have all talked about for years. We've got all this and more. Welcome to Speedway Report. Monday, December the 10th, it's clicking away here, the calendar is, 2018 from the shores of frozen Lake Norman in Ray City, USA, Mooresville, North Carolina. I'm Patrick Reynolds, and thank you for joining the fastest half hour in racing. The lake really isn't frozen, literally, but this area just north of Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, had anywhere from 6 inches to 18 inches of snow and ice, depending on where you were, which in December is pretty rare. I think I've only seen that happen one other time since I moved here about 17 years ago. But it's chilly. My blood is thinned, and I'll complain about it because I'm a Southerner now. I know Northerners will laugh, but I came from the mods. I don't forget the mods up north, but the weather, yeah, I have embraced the Southern culture. What's up with the snow? I'm inside. I'm in the studio. I'll wait for it to melt. That's when it will go away. Let's talk about the small snowball derby down in Pensacola, Florida. Had a lot of weather-related uh, issues last weekend when we ran the big super late model 300 down there. Uh, Friday night's action after snowball derby qualifying, as well as pretty much all of Saturday, got washed out. So we ran the modified race, the pro truck race, and the pro late model snowflake 100. Yesterday, the modified race was taken by Augie Grill, the pro truck feature by Josh Hicks, and the Snowflake 100 by Chase Purdy. Let's dive right in to what is going on with the, with the Snowball Derby as we wrapped it up. Well, those that followed online really at the end of the race are better, I guess, than halfway through the Snowflake 100. All got our attention on the internet if you're watching on the Speed 51 broadcast and if you're following online. It's always good. Sometimes there's a winner like there was in Chase Purdy. Good for him. But sometimes there's a story that takes away from the win because of all of the churning and fire that comes from that. Let's talk about Mr. Dylan Oliver. Good racer. But there was an incident and then stuff and all kinds of stuff happened. Then it caused a big snowball effect, no pun intended. Let's let's let this set the table for you here. Dylan Oliver was taken out of the Snowflake 100 uh, from a pretty hard crash. He crashed with Spencer Davis and Mason Diaz. And as the cars, uh, Oliver and Davis were up against the fence, Oliver gets out of his car. Rolls over to Spencer Davis's car. The two of them exchanging words. Well, Davis was not at fault in the incident, but he points down the hill or away at Mason Diaz. So Dylan Oliver goes running over to Mason Diaz, climbs up into the hauler, and the two of them exchange words. Uh, I did not get the quotes directly, so... I can't attribute them to me like I was some journalistic expert on this one, but I'm going to steal them from the Speed 51 TV interview. A lot of you saw it. This was all online. This was the buzz last night. Uh, at, we'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, in the Speed 51 interview from Dylan Oliver. That's the problem with pro late model racing. You've got a bunch of dumbasses out there. There's a bunch of rich kids who don't give a blank about tearing up race cars. So... Bob Dillner follows it up with the question, hey, why don't you go super late model racing as opposed to pro late model racing? Blanking can't afford it. So Dylan Oliver uh, didn't get the family hour award for last night on Speed 51 TV, but man, we ought to talk about non-vanilla race car drivers and guys that speak their mind and just say what's on their heart. He sure did. Uh, reminds me of the old days of A.J. Foyt. We could talk about some guys uh, being whiny and baby nowadays, and some guys just tell it like it is. There's a difference. But the whole, you know, the whole aspect of this is that Oliver brought out a topic that racing gets talked about an awful lot. Uh, the rich kids. Rich kids buying rides. There's someone with a silver spoon in their mouth where the talent gets overlooked in motorsports. And the kid with the checkbook or dad with the trust fund 
is feeding the kids racing habit or racing career, and that is why he is out there to begin with. This, gosh, if, if you want to back this out a little bit, way past the Snowflake 100 to all of auto racing, it has been a big hit in one regard to the sport, yet the money that has been brought in has been a boon to the sport. So it's a very much a double-edged sword. Where we start to lose folks is the aspect of the rich kids, the Silver Spoon Trust Fund crowd. Um, when I grew up in racing and we watched our heroes, I'd say my formative, formulative years were in the 70s and the 80s as a young kid and as a teenager. And you watched guys that were carpenters and were race car drivers and were plumbers and were race car drivers or were mechanics during the week or were plumbers or, you know, farmers or contractors, blue collar guys that went out there and made a career out of racing. Uh, so many folks, you, 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 you think of the guys that grew up with, I know, uh, you know, Dale Earnhardt worked in the cotton mill and Harry Gant, and he had a farm and a roofer and, uh, Neil Bonnet was a pipe fitter, and there's so many guys that they had skill, they had a job, and were able to make it as a professional race car driver. So these guys, the heroes of NASCAR, really identified with their fan base because the fan base is looking at this race car driver and says, that could be me. That could be me. I can be him. He is me. That's why you know Dale Earnhardt identified with so many, or so many people identified with who Dale Earnhardt was. Or, you know, Neil Bonnet, the, the Harry Gantz, those, those salts of the earth people, real people, blue collar people with dirt under their fingernails that earned a living for their family. They were just able to carve out a living and a career and were able to, to mold that as being a race car driver. And where a lot of professional motorsports is faded in the interest is the drivers are not like that anymore. They are some of these kids. Some of them are adults now, but they had money. That's why they're race car drivers. Not because they clawed and worked and sacrificed and toiled and made their way to the top of professional motorsports. They bought their way there. And that is absolutely a disconnect. And this came to light. I, I mean, gosh, this is happening for literally decades. But it certainly popped last night with Dylan Oliver's comments, uh, you know, after he got crashed out of the snowflake. 100. I want to read you a little bit more of uh, his deal. And I'm going to take this, uh, I'm going to read this right from, I'm going to give proper credit where credit is due, uh, Short Track Scene, shorttrackscene.com. It's Matt Weaver's website, good dude, follows uh, professional motorsports as well as the short track scene uh, very tightly. I'll, I'll read it right from his website. Dylan Oliver was mad with Spencer Davis and then was mad at Mason Diaz, and then he was mad at the entire pro late model dynamic. Oliver was involved in a lap 30 crash with Davis, Diaz, and JoJo Wilkinson. It began when Davis tagged by Diaz, who was sideways on the track, and collected Oliver in the process. Or, initially, Oliver confronted Davis. After their conversation, Oliver confronted Diaz and eventually followed up inside a hauler to discuss the incident. This is where my quote was before that I, that I cleaned up for you a, a, a little bit there. Uh, this is the problem with late model racing. We have a bunch of dumbasses out there. We go into a little bit new here. It's lap 10 or 15, and they're dooring each other on the restart. And whoever the dumbass is, which he was referring to Diaz, is the black and blue and white car, the 14 or 24 or whatever. He drove into Spencer's left rear, and they didn't, the track is blocked, and you can't go nowhere. And they're... He rambled on before about the rich kid factor in something like that. This is one, this isn't uh, exclusive to pro late model racing. This is an epidemic in, in all of motorsports. It's not a new thing. This has been around since I was a little kid that has been happening. The first place I noticed it is in Formula One and IndyCar when I was a younger guy that there was a complaint a lot of drivers not earning their stripes, not earning their way up through the ranks, not being qualified to handle a professional race car in professional conditions, but they came with a sponsor. Somehow they had money, they got there, and they were not considered quality drivers. They weren't. I've seen some good ones. I've seen some bad ones with money, but they weren't considered quality drivers. That bled up, down into the stock car world. As I grew up a big NASCAR fan, <clears throat> more involved with that 
and more passionately about that several decades ago than the IndyCar world. However, it still followed IndyCar. You saw it in the stock cars. And some guys got a bad rap for it, and some guys kind of flew under the radar about it. Um, I remember a lot of folks, you know, some you know, guys in Indy cars, gosh, in the 70s and the 80s that came with a sponsor, and they were at the Indy 500, but there were complaints that did, did not belong there. Um, in one hand, I get that. You know, I, I wish drivers earned their rides on merit. A lot of them earn it because they have money. Uh, Brett Moffat is out of his ride at Hittori Racing. They just won the NASCAR Truck Series Championship. A funded driver is taking that spot. If you win the championship in the Truck Series, what does a guy got to do to keep his seat? However, on the flip side of that, put, her, put yourself in Shiggy Hittori's shoes. If you don't have the money to field the truck for next year, you're going to go belly up and shut the doors anyway. And you're going to be out of business. If anybody has a solution to this, I'm ready to hear it because I don't. I, I don't have this. I get where Dylan Oliver's come from. I agree with him. As a race fan and observer, I don't care about a bunch of guys that got a checkbook and I'm supposed to care and think that they're good and believe that they're good when they're really not. But at the same time, these rides would not exist if it wasn't, if it wasn't for the money. In road racing, they have professional race car drivers in which they are paid, and they also have what's called gentleman race car drivers who pay to race. You see these guys in a lot of the endurance format of that. We've had John Pugh as a guest on this show several times. He was teammates with Oz Negri in the IMSA series for several years. Oz, the professional race car driver. John Pugh, the gentleman race car driver. John Pugh is as good of a road racer as you're going to find anywhere. Yeah, he is the gentleman. He pays to drive the car, and he was a partner with Oz. Oz is a professional who gets paid. But there are some gentleman race car drivers which are darn good. They just happen to be in a situation where they can bring money to the table and get themselves a ride. Not everybody that has money is a bad race car driver. A guy that got a bad rap earlier in his career was Jeff Gordon. He, So many people criticized him when he was 21 years old that he got everything handed to him. Nobody, nobody heard of a 21-year-old guy in the Winston Cup Series in Hendrick cars for no less – running up front and winning. It didn't happen. It doesn't happen. It's impossible. He changed the sport. However, at 21 years old, he had over 15 years of racing experience between quarter midgets and his USAC starts. Okay, no matter how you slice it, somebody's got to pay for the car. Somebody's it's got to happen for it. There's got to be a check coming from somewhere. So Gordon got a rap that his old man bought him everything, and away he went. Well, Jeff Gordon turned out, to be one of the best race car drivers any of us has ever seen, ever on the planet. Yeah, he had to have some backing in order to race as a kid because he doesn't have a paper route that's going to pay for a race car driver. I got into a, a discussion decades ago with another guy, and he says, God, I can't stand Jeff Gordon. He had everything handed to him. I said, who's your favorite race car driver? He said, Mark Martin. I said, do you know Mark Martin was running ASA when he was a teenager, right? He said, yeah. I said, how do you think, who do you think paid for that? You think Mark Martin at 16 had a killer paper route and was able to afford a, an ASA team? No, of course not. But I don't beat up Mark Martin about it. Still, another one of the best drivers we've ever seen. I won't beat up Jeff Gordon about it. One of the best drivers we've ever seen, but somebody had to pay for it. From Richard Petty, who got his cars from Lee Petty, Dale Earnhardt, who used the garage from Ralph Earnhardt, there had to have been some way to get some some backing, some funding, some support to make this happen. In today's day and age, Paul Menard, I highly doubt he'd ever be a race car driver if he didn't have backing from dad's company. Now, has he ever blossomed into a good race car driver? He's blossomed into a fair one, an adequate one. He's a mid-pack runner. So, I mean, you know, you know, run the NASCAR Cup in mid-pack, you're still decent. But that that car and those sponsorships or the team wouldn't exist without Menard's money. So if you say, Menard, you really didn't earn your way here, the team may just go away totally. Joey Logano got his way into the Cup Series because his father, Tom Logano, is an extremely wealthy man. Now, Joey's delivered on the promise and become a Cup champion and won plenty of races, but he wouldn't be where he is without Dad's money. He was running uh, Hooters Pro Cup as a teenager, Bandoleros as a kid. 
Dad spent a whole lot of money. He got him into Joe Gibbs Racing by a whole lot of money to Joe Gibbs Racing. He got his shot. But if you cannot handle the race car, it'll show up on the racetrack. It, 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 you can't buy your entire career like that. A guy like, uh, you know, you want to take Menard, kind of a mid-pack runner, won the Brickyard 400 several years ago. I don't see him moving out of mid-pack ever in Cup Series. Joey Logano is a Cup Series champion. I don't care how much money Dad has. If you can't drive the race car, that's going to come up. Joey Logano had the backing, had the money, can drive the race car, always has. Love him, hate him, whatever. Logano can drive a race car. Danica Patrick bought brought funding, ran for in NASCAR for five years, was pretty much a 30th place driver all five years. That car needed the sponsorship that she brought to it. What did they change for it in 2018? They changed the seat, and look what Eric Almarola did with it. Came within a mile of winning the Daytona 500, came within so close of winning several other races this year, probably could have had three or four wins if the stars lined up right for him. Finally did make Tal win Talladega. He made the si final 16 in the playoffs and went to the final eight and just missed out on going by the narrowest of margins, going to the final four at Homestead. All they did is change the seat in that. Eric Almarola brought Smithfield Meats to the this, to this, uh, table this year as a sponsor to replace Danica Patrick's funding, but he can still drive the race car. Danica Patrick brought funding, but much like Paul Menard, is a mid-pack and the best day runner in NASCAR. So where do we go with this? We, you know, Dylan, Al Dylan Oliver, back to where we started, has an extremely valid complaint that you got guys out there that don't belong out there, but they have money. Now, I don't know Mason Diaz, never met the dude. I don't know how good he is or how bad he is, but here's Dylan Oliver pointing out that the emperor has no clothes. So do we reduce car counts? like Shiggy Hitori going away, or do you keep them funded? Paul Menard, that's a, an RCR team. Is it funded or does it go away? Or you try to get a talented driver in there, and then hopefully you'll sign a sponsor because you're running up front. <sighs> Talk about a vicious cycle. Dylan Oliver, I hear you 100%. I agree with you 100%. I don't have an answer for any of this but it is something that has absolutely plagued the sport and has certainly caused some empty seats in NASCAR for sure because we're not rooting for Harry Gant, Neil Botta, and Dale Earnhardt every year like we used to, but we're having trouble finding a new guy to root for because daddy's paycheck got him to where he wants to be. That's affected the car counts in a positive way, but it's affected the grandstands and TV ratings certainly in a negative way. Jump into the Snowball Derby itself out of this. I want to touch on the schedule for the race. Uh, originally scheduled for Saturday night, postponed to Sunday afternoon. Just seems like they dragged their feet on this, despite of the rain. Uh, we ran, uh, uh, let me uh, clarify this, Five Flag Speedway in Pensacola is on Central Time, so I'll be referencing that. But it started uh, pits, or pits opening at 8. We started practicing at 11 and racing at 2. The modified race was at 2. Took over two hours to run, about two and a half hours because of so many cautions and reds. Then we want, uh, it was still uh, red checkered after with about four laps to go on the 75 lapper. But at 2 o'clock, we started the modified race, and then we had pro late model qualifying, pro late model last chance qualifier, pro truck qualifying, the Snowflake 100, and finally the pro truck 50. Well, after two and a half hours at the uh, of running this modified race, you've got you know 4:30 quarter to five in the afternoon, and you've only run one race on a Sunday afternoon. At 5:30, the rain started uh, raining down there, and it delayed the start of the Snowflake 100. And to me, if it is raining at 5:30 on a Sunday afternoon, you should have already been buttoning up the entire program. Uh, it seems like this whole thing could have been pushed along to begin earlier in the morning to get a couple of brief practice rounds in. I understand waving qualifying, but you could have gotten the whole race program going by noon, 1 o'clock. Uh, but we got these late start times, and we don't got to get on track too early. But we could have pushed this uh, pushed this up a little, a lot. You know, the Snowflake 100 took the checkered flag so late, then they ran the Pro 
uh, truck race after that. It was 11 o'clock midnight before this thing finally buttoned up. Uh, I think we went to – they scrapped qualifying for everybody and just started everybody by the practice speeds. But at 7.30 on a Sunday night, the snowflake is finally taking the green flag. Yeah, it shouldn't be that way. If it's raining at 5.30, I mean, you should have wrapped this whole thing up at 4 or 5 o'clock anyway. I don't know why we didn't get to start it at noon um, unless that was in the plan to sell more hamburgers. I've seen that a lot at Thompson and Stafford over the years where it's just the Sunday afternoon stuff just drags on and on, and it goes well into Sunday night, and it shouldn't. Sunday afternoon shows should be done over at 4 or 5 o'clock and get everybody home to dinner. I've always said that. You run your Friday night and Saturday night shows – I just never like these Sunday afternoon shows that dragged on way longer than they should to get you to get you home late. We were plagued by a lot of caution flags, a lot of red flags. Snowflake 100 was run in a wet mist. God bless those guys for even getting that thing in. But it is raining at uh, 5.30 on a Sunday afternoon. That race already should have been in the books. Uh, I would have redone that schedule to get everybody in on a Sunday and got them out quickly. You should be throwing the first green flag at noon, not at 2 on a Sunday. Uh, yeah, we could have kept caution flags counting a lot earlier in the modified race, too. It just seems like, you know, I, I agree postponing it a day early be, uh, because of the forecast on Saturday. It was wet. It was a mess. Uh, it would have been nice to look at Sunday afternoon. And, and this isn't me in hindsight. I looked at it ahead of time going, geez, they're running this thing really late. Uh, into Sunday night, even on the best day with, without cautions and with better weather. Run it Sunday afternoon. Get folks on the way. Get ho folks home. The, I know you got some people that went to Pensacola yesterday that might not return just because that schedule was dragged out too much. That was a, that was a rough deal there. Um, Grandview Speedway in Pennsylvania. Bummer, but they're dropping the late model class. They've seen the car counts dwindle year after year. So the Modifieds and Sportsmen will be a dual division show this Saturday night at the Grandview Speedway on the hill in Pennsylvania. I got to get back there. That was one of my – I've only been there once, but, man, what an experience. What a good track that was. But, uh, yeah, no late models there this year. But they'll have some specials, but it'll be two-division open-wheel show uh, at Grandview Speedway on Saturday nights for 2019. In between our broadcasts, keep up on the world of auto racing with SpeedwayReport.com. This show and all of our past ones are uploaded on the site. We've also got some articles to read. Uh, check out our Facebook page, Speedway Report with Patrick Reynolds, the Racers Reunion page. On Twitter, I'm at Speedway Pat and at Speedway Report. And we also have copies of this show in the forum on RacersReunion.com. Go check out me on Google Plus and LinkedIn and our YouTube channel. Yeah, you want to watch any old Speedway reports, they are all right here. Big thanks to everyone on the Facebook Live feed for joining the conversation during this show tonight. I would like to thank all of the military past and present for the freedoms we enjoy as Americans in our daily life, including the simple things like bench racing right here on a Monday night. Freedom is not free, and a veteran paid that bill for us. To all of the men and women who are defending freedom and watching Speedway Report, take care of yourselves and come home soon. A special salute to the teachers, school staff, firefighters, police officers, and paramedics in our own communities. They are quiet and modest heroes every single day. God bless and thank you. You have been watching Speedway Report from the shores of Lake Norman in Race City, USA, Mooresville, North Carolina. Please like our Facebook page, Speedway Report with Patrick Reynolds, and follow me on Twitter at Speedway Pat. Now, if you're watching us live on Facebook, go on over to the Drag Racing List page. Uh, Racing and Rockin' is about to start at the top of the hour. Uh, BP, JB, and BS are on there with uh, drag racing and some very cool music. We'll be back live here on Facebook in one week, Monday, December the 17th, for our final show of 2018. And we'll, we'll take a look at whatever I can get my hands on. We're one week before Christmas. Trust me, I will find some racing to talk about. I'll find it. I just don't know what it is yet. We'll talk about it right here in one week. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and I'll see you guys next time.